Welcome everyone to the first ever Talks at Temple. We are thrilled to launch this new series as the kickoff event for the inauguration of Temple University's 12th president, Dr. Jason Wingard. My name is not Luann Kahn. Luann was supposed to emcee this amazing event today, but this morning, Luann became a first-time grandmother. <laughs> so baby mom and grandmom are all doing great, so I will pass on your good wishes. My name is, however, Amy Caples. I'm an assistant professor of instruction in media studies and production in Klein College. I'm also a proud member of the Temple University class of 1985. Represent. It is so great to see so many Temple students, alumni, and community partners here for this signature event. As Philadelphia's university, Temple transforms the lives of students as well as patients and community members throughout the region. We pride ourselves on experiential learning, the discovery of self and the world. The Talks at Temple Thought Leadership Series invites bold discourse to support that Temple mission, and it explores pressing topics at the intersection of learning and work. As someone who has taught professional development to Klein College students for the past 17 years, I feel deeply connected to the vision of Talks at Temple. It aligns with the goals of launching Temple University students into a complex world and workforce and showing the excellence of our very gritty Temple Owls. Talks at Temple is freely available globally through YouTube and allows Temple to reach a wide global and diverse audience. Today we'll present two premier talks engaging with two top professionals from across film to consumer goods to social media. In our first ever Talks at Temple, we are proud to showcase Philadelphia's filmmaker, the illustrious M. Night Shyamalan, and our president, Dr. Jason Wingard, on the eve of his official inauguration. They will talk about the future of film and entertainment and how it relates to the future of work. It's an industry quickly evolving because of ongoing trends and disruptions in the field and because of the monumental behavioral changes further propelled by the pandemic. This will be followed by a second talk led by Temple's Vice President for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Dr. Valerie Harrison will moderate a discussion with three panelists from Fortune 100 companies. Maxine Williams, Chief Diversity Officer at Meta, Erica Irish Brown, Chief Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Officer and Global Head of Talent at Citi, and Reginald Miller, Vice President, Global Chief, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Officer at McDonald's. Expect some lively discussion as we delve into issues that are deeply personal to many and important to all. Before we get started, a few housekeeping items. This event is being recorded and we appreciate the silencing of your cell phones. For your socials, the hashtags are hashtag TUI inauguration and hashtag talks at temple with an AT. I'm honored to introduce the first speakers of the day, renowned filmmaker M. Night Shyamalan and President Jason Wingard. M. Night Shyamalan is a local Thank you. Growing up just outside Philadelphia and hasn't strayed far even with all of his fame, settling down as an adult with his wife and children in Chester County. He's given Philadelphia a starring role in some of Hollywood's biggest movies. He has written and directed 19 movies and shows, produced 18 and starred in 14, all grossing more than three billion at the box office. His latest film, Knock at the Cabin, comes out in 2023, and Into Caddo Lake will soon follow. He's also executive producing the dramatic series Servants, based where else in Philadelphia. He also believes deeply in innovative education and has written a book on the topic. It's called I Got Schooled, the unlikely story of how a moonlighting movie maker learned the five keys to closing America's education gap. This passion has been instrumental in his foundation work. He leads the M. Night Shyamalan Foundation, which is focused on emerging leaders as they work to eliminate barriers created by poverty and social injustice in their communities. Knight, please accept our warmest welcome to TU. 
M. Night Shyamalan. You are going to hear a lot about our president, Dr. Jason Wingard, over the next few days, so let me focus on some items that are germane to today's discussions. President Wingard's new book, The College Devaluation Crisis, is, like Knight's book, an urgent call to action to rethink education. His career has toggled between education, nonprofit, and corporate, working at institutions from Stanford, Penn, and Columbia, to Goldman Sachs, Vanguard, and the Aspen Institute. He understands the future of work from the perspective of an employer, as well as the perspective of institutions preparing graduates for future success. President Wingard has five children, middle school, high school, and college aged, and is invested in preparing the next generations for the future of learning and work, not just as a president of a university, but also as a parent. So let's begin. Welcome, President Wingard. Hello. Hello to you. Hi, guys. How are you? M. Night Shyamalan. Oscar-nominated, super movie producer, film director, TV series, blah, blah, blah. Let's give it up again for M. Night Shyamalan. So we're going to talk, as Professor Capel said, we're going to talk about the future of entertainment. And we're going to navigate ourselves through a variety of different topics picking your brain a little bit about where are we going in this entertainment industry. There's sure. a lot of disruption, there's a lot of change taking place, and you are right in the heart of experiencing what that feels like. But before we get to that, let's start with Penn Valley. You're from Penn Valley, not far from here, Temple sure. University, not far from where I grew up in Westchester. Yes. And you are notoriously uh, responsible for developing a lot of your films, your highest grossing films, right here mm. in the Philadelphia region. Talk to us about why you do that. Is there a personal reason for that? Is there a practical reason for that? Is there a strategic reason why you, unlike many others, do your films right here in this region? Um, well, first of all, thank you guys for having me and for inviting me. This is so wonderful. And get me out of the editing room for a second so I can stop obsessing about whatever I was cutting. Um, you know, ultimately, I think the, the, the initial thing is that I felt very fragile as I was making stories and writing stories and felt the, the strongest when I was at home here in Philly around my family and felt, uh, I don't know if I could have made it in Los Angeles. So there was just a, this, a, me as a, the makeup of me as a human being I thought was very too delicate. Like I would be very influenced by everybody and everything. And to me, movie making and, is very magical. And um, you know, just keeping it in my head and not making it a business was, I mean, in retrospect, some of the things that I was trying to stay uh, close to. And ironically, I think that it turned out to be an incredible practical strength that my voice is very distinct. It doesn't feel like other people's voices. It's not as adulterated, let's say, uh, you know, that would happen if you're having lunch constantly with filmmakers and, and writers and everyone that, you know, saying, hey, you know, they're making a ghost story. Do you want to make a ghost story? Or, you know, we're all, it's coming from more of a calculated place. And for me, it's just whatever pops into my head. And most people in Philly, as I was growing up, didn't work in the movie industry. So I was the only one. Everyone else was, you know, an investment or a doctor or whatever it was. And, this is still magical and unusual to me. And I think that that individual voice, both that I was an immigrant, my parents were immigrants, you know, um, mixed with this, this kind of a filmmaker outside of Los Angeles created a very distinct voice. And, and that's ironically become a very powerful tool in commerce around the world that they can hear in Paris and in Mexico City. They, they go, oh, that's his voice. And they come for that. So let me, let me go back to the topic I started with, which is disruption in the industry. Mm -hmm. So the entertainment industry has been disrupted unlike any other. COVID has accelerated. The disruption started before COVID, mm -hmm. and then COVID accelerated that because people were in their homes, literally locked in their homes. They could not consume content anywhere else other than being at home. And so the whole world changed. 
for entertainment in terms of how you respond to that. When you look at some, Variety did some data collection and they said that 49% of pre-pandemic movie go goers have stopped going to the movies. Mm -hmm. So half of them have stopped for now. Mm -hmm. About 10%, they, they say, are never going back. Mm -hmm. So when you think about creating content and developing movies for the American yeah. and the global consumers, yes. knowing the trends that we have now post-COVID, yes. how does that affect the way in which you think about creating content, the way in which you predict it will be distributed moving forward. Does it change the creative work, the business side of it, mm -hmm. or is it the same? You know, I have a very uh, outlier position on this. Um, uh, you know, in, in times of, of difficulty or challenge and all, what, what you know, I find works best for people that are successful is doubling down on their value system, the things that they, they have studied and go, this, I'll burn the house down for this. So you can't pay me, there's no amount of money, there's nothing, I'm, we're gonna burn the house down for, if I have to lose this. Um, and for me, doubling down on those things is, you know, I'm very vocal about movie theaters are going nowhere and we're, uh, we're gonna be booming. This is, these are not comparable art forms, eating a taco, while you're on the computer and your dog's licking you while you're watching a show uh, is not the same as two hours you're not allowed to do anything else. Mul the only time in your life you're not allowed to multitask, you know, in, in that movie theater and you come with a bunch of strangers, people that you've never met before, and you consume an art form and each of you is affecting each other. That is a very different, that is the highest form of, of what we do. Watching it at home is a... I'm asking less of you, we're asking less of you, and the commitment is less. You know the commitment, you have any time you can do this, or you can get on the phone, or you know, all that stuff. That's all psychologically there. Um, so I have, you know, when I talk to the heads of studios, I say to them lots of things, like the chairmans and all that stuff. I say, I don't, I don't, I'm not, I don't buy your, the, the streaming thing. I don't buy it. I don't buy that it's profitable. I don't buy, I buy that you can do it without us in the way you think. Um, and you can't get zeitgeist. You can't, I, it's, it's just very, very hard. You can get, I've seen it done now many times with TV shows, Stranger Things and, and such like that, but very rarely, if not never, with a movie. Um, it's just very hard to do, and in almost every other week in the movie theater, you get some movie that gets some zeitgeist, that gets, gets you guys and holds you. That's because the commitment is much deeper from you. You're, you're stopping your lives, you're committing, you're putting it into your, your DNA and you watch and you give us your everything of yourselves and you demand a higher form when you're watching it. And, and so it gets into your skin more and you talk to your friends and it just becomes more culturally significant. Um, for all the billions and billions and billions and billions they put into movies on the streamers, all of them, all the biggest companies in the world, all of them, which movie has had impact? You know, of all of, of, all of these companies throwing everything they can and they, they throw incredible amounts of money at all of us to do it. So it's just a different thing. Not saying it's negative, pejorative, or anything like that. For me, it's just a, di a different art form. I find that art form works best in the long form for me, where you guys get to spend time with a character, you know, characters, and you get to follow it week after week after week, like Game of Thrones, or Stranger Things, or Servant, you know, these kind of, where you get to know them and you come back over and over and over. And so you, you know, I think it's a great, great medium for that, where you come home and you, you get to know these people over and over and over, but that two hour format, for me is the, is the movie theaters, and, and so I double down, double down on that. So you're bullish on mm. the old school model. Yeah, and what you're seeing right now is a little bit of the industry, which is, a lot of it is run by these big corporations, big companies, that want that big subscription thing. They all want their own Netflix underneath them, right? So let's say Netflix is the only streamer that's actually making money now day to day. That doesn't mean they're profitable, because we don't know their debt, right? Their debt could be, they'll never, they'll never get over that, right? So the only streamer that's making money is Netflix, and so every other streamer is trying to get to day-to-day -day profit, which I don't think that any of them will, because it costs so much to do the things that we're doing, and you're consuming it so transitionally that you can't keep up. How much does an episode of Mandalorian cost? How much does it, you know, it just takes, it's so much effort and the grind to, to deliver for you guys that much content. I only do half hours for Apple, my half hour thrillers, right? But I'm still delivering you five hours of material uh, in that show every year. That's two, over two movies every year. So in the four years that I've done this show, I'm like, that's 10 movies I could have made for you guys. I mean, that's the amount of work that I'm, that I'm doing. It's not sustainable. So I, the person that's equivalent would have to 
you cut corners and then you guys will feel that and then your commitment will go down and you'll feel the thing go like that and it's inevitable. It's not possible to, to keep up with that. So, so let me stay yeah. on that point yeah, for a me. second because if I underscore what you're saying, because my next question is, who's going to win the streaming wars, right? Yeah. But the beginning of the question is, the opening credits yeah. for movies, it used to read 20th Century Fox and Paramount Pictures and Miramax, and now you see Hulu and Netflix and yeah. Apple Plus. Yeah. And so there's a war between these companies, both yeah. you know, who is going to be distributing the content and making it, and then there's a war within the streamers as well. Yes. So we all know that Netflix is winning, but who do you think is gonna win the war between old school and new school? Who's gonna win the war between the streamers? You know, again, it's, it's so, but just think about what they're trying to say. You guys are gonna subscribe based on ultimately original content that's going, you know, once Netflix didn't have the monopoly, right? One, once one time Netflix had everybody, had all of our movies on there. Right, they were the only streamer. <clears throat> but then once everyone pulled, Warner Brothers pulled their movies, everyone, Disney pulled their movies, one by one, everything's pulled out. Now Netflix has to make original content, which is why we're all streaming. When we look at Netflix and we just keep on going, hey, let's find something, let's find something, let's find something. Then we watch that serial murder documentary again, right? We, we go, <laughs> we're, we're like, huh, and it's hard, it's hard. And so even Apple, that they're doing all original. So they, their mandate, which is, Amazing. They don't. They don't start with a library. So we're all, everything we're doing. Ted Lasso, my show, is all original. So they've done a great job. It's it's a, it's a Herculean task to do what we're saying. When the subscriptions hit a certain number, when when can you make profit? But all the money that they need to make each of our episodes, you know, it's it's a tricky thing. I don't think I don't think anybody really wins this one. I. I mm -hmm. uh, I think they thought that they were all once upon a time, especially with COVID, which gave a false positive because everyone was, was at home and, and everyone was watching for a moment, you know, but, you know, I, you know everything, every there, everything everywhere all at once just became A24's number one movie, you know, right now, right? And Top Gun, the, the new Top Gun did over $1.3 billion right now. And I keep can go how these anomalous movies are going through the roof in a way that we've never seen. What you just saw in the last three weeks is kind of the after effect of COVID, which was all the movie makers and all the studios made movies for the streamers and, and neglected the movie theater. So you're seeing this gap right now of, of product. So this, this last weekend, the weekend before that, this has never happened where there wasn't a giant movie to, to open, right? And so we're opening February 3rd, and I don't know how many big movies before me are, are opening, but it's the least amount that has ever happened because of this kind of lag effect, because it takes two years to make a movie. So I'm gonna ask you a two-part question. Most of the movies you've made, the commercial success that you've had, have been at Walt Disney Studios, Touchstone, uh, Hollywood Pictures, but now you're also developing, so it's the third year of Servant? Yes, third season. Fourth, fourth year. Fourth, fourth yeah. year, you know, so, you know, Servant's being streamed on Apple Plus. Yes. So for you, as the content creator and producer, does it matter to you? You have, an, you have a point of view on the producers, the, the, the distribution companies, but for you as a content producer, does it matter which one? If Walt Disney says we're gonna get uh -huh. contract with you or Apple Plus, does it matter to you? For me in particular, it was important to be at Apple because I wanted to start with them. I wanted to help define them. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and Servant Now is kind of their second most successful show underneath Ted Lasso. And I wanted to be a part of that, them defining who they are. Just like, well, there's another filmmaker, David Fincher, who started with Netflix. And he, and he did his show, House of Cards, and get, got it to, to define that place. So that part was important, that I had a company that had a brand and that could, you know, uh, appreciate the, the kind of uh, value system that I, that I have. So that one was a little bit important for me, the partner. And, and uh, one thing I should probably mention is from like eight years ago, I stopped doing movies in the normal way. So about eight years ago, when we speak of disruption and things like that, I have went through a, a kind of a bad patch, I think, in terms of having confidence in myself. Um, and, and, you know, the system is constantly trying to convince you you're powerless. That is just, that's what a system does. And so join us and do this X, Y, Z and join the system and we'll give you success. We'll get you the things that you want. And I think that that confused me. I know that it confused me uh, being a kind of an author from when I was you know, your age. And I was, I was tired, it's hard. And I, I was like, is there an easier way? And I got seduced and I feel like I lost my voice and I lost my connection to my own power for a while. And it got so bad where I was, down and I wasn't successful and I wasn't 
enjoying what I was doing, and I said, I'm not doing this anymore, um, so I'm just going to pay for everything. I'm going to mortgage the house, and I'm going to make a movie. I'm not going to ask anyone's permission. And I started that, I forgot what year, it's been eight years, nine years. So I pay for everything um, that, that I do now. And so that began with The Visit, and that was a movie that I mortgaged the house and, made, and ended up making $100 million in the theaters. And you know, each, each movie then split, and then, and then Glass, and then Old, and then Knock at the Cabin, and also Servant I pay for it as well. So I'm, I'm, I'm the one sole crazy person in the world that, pay, that pays. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, J Jay-Z says that, don't take other people's don't money. Don't take, yeah, that's right. So when you t let's talk about the creative side a little bit, because you started going down this path. So Servant has been hailed as the most addictive show in the history of TV series, right? And I can attest to that. That show, you don't want to ever stop watching <laughs> it. So th the question I have for you is, what goes into the process? of making somebody so enraptured with a television show like that, number one. Mm. Then the second part of that is, when you and I were younger, mm -hmm. we used to have to watch TV shows on a week by week, week clip. Yeah. So if you were watching The Million Dollar Man or Dallas, you had to wait tonight, Thursday, until yep. next week to yep. be able to watch the show. And so you have to think that those shows were written and directed and produced in a different way, knowing that people couldn't watch the shows except for week on a week basis. Now, I can watch Servant and I can see all three seasons mm -hmm. in a row if mm -hmm. I want to stay up all night and all week and be able to do that. So mm. what is the process for creating this kind of creative, addictive content? And how does it change when you know that people can watch the whole season all at once versus you rolling it out week at a time? That, those are really complex questions. I, um... I, I, I feel like the reason that the, the show is so sticky is that we've re, we were the first kind of half-hour thriller. For that, that format, it sounds like a, a minor adjustment, but it's not. It's, it's, I could pull all the fat off the bone, and I can aim you guys and make it like a, you know, a 30-minute sequence. And, and, and I, that, that allows me to give you just enough information and aim you in the architecture. In this particular story, there's kind of like a very tragic family story and then this mythology on top of it and how we're unfolding both of those movements. The, the engine of the show is uh, a woman who doesn't remember that her child has died and that she was culpable in this. So she just doesn't remember that. That engine is so powerful that it, it, it pushes you through every episode. Oh my God, is she gonna remember? Is she gonna remember? Is she gonna remember? And then this nanny that comes who is a part of this larger mythology and who is she and what is, what, what is this about? You know, what is the show? And, and me aiming that architecture. And one of the things that happened during COVID that was a positive is that we all had to stop. And so basically I was in my house and just architectured the rest of the story. Like the, at that time it was, we were in the middle of the second season, so I could go, okay, these are the last 25 episodes. Like, I put it on a board and did the whole thing, and I said, it wants to do this without any fat. Where, where would it go? And it was, oh, this is 40 episodes, so it's four seasons, and so got, got to do that. And I think that the audience smelling that each of the things knows exactly where it's going, how, how it's going, it's not, I'm not vamping. And you can tell, even at, you know, we can't ever lie to you. I mean, I think as an artist, whether it's a musician or all, you can feel us when we're, when we're uh, corrupting ourselves and so if you felt me vamping because they threw me a lot of money to do a season five and and you could feel me you'll feel it no matter how much I'm trying you'll feel it and you go oh wow what, what is he doing you know um, um, and so hopefully the integrity of the piece that hey we're done the story's done that you feel that movement you know where you are you're watching episode 32 you know exactly oh my god I'm only I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm eight episodes from the end yeah. so that's the hope so let's talk about talent because you have people here at Temple University here in the yeah. room who are studying. Yeah. And they're approaching the entertainment industry from a lot of different angles. So you yeah. have business school students here. You have law students here. You have students from our theater and film uh, group coming here. You have communication. So there's little bits and pieces, as you know, of the communication industry. And as we talk about disruption, there are new angles. So when people ask me, hey, should I be a reporter, an investigative reporter anymore? Can, is journalism dying? Mm -hmm. should, I, can, should I be a director or producer like M. Night Shyamalan? Can I be successful? What is your answer? And I'll, and I'll root that in, are you finding the talent that you need right now from Temple and other universities to be able to sustain your business and be competitive? And 
What is your advice to them about what they should be doing to get themselves ready? Or your advice mm. to us? Yeah, I mean, yeah, you should go for it. I mean, I'll, I mean, <laughs> I, I'll, I'll love it. There's not, not enough people in the world that have trained and are willing to iterate and take risks. Uh, there's no way to play it safe. I can't, even sitting here in front of you, I'm getting ready to do the next movie and it hurts and it's scary. And there's just, if I try to protect myself, you're, I won't grow. And, and I won't be valid, you know, if, you know, if Knock at the Cabin opens number one, that would have been the, the fourth decade of movies that my movies have opened number one in, in the world. And, um, you know, that requires you constantly, I have to just become you again. I just have to be all, all over again, the new student and risk everything. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. You have to have that. As soon as you know, you stop, stop growing. That was, just at that moment, that thing that you knew, and now it's different. I, I, I tend, and another thing that I do really, I think that's unusual in the industry, I use new people all the time. So, like the composer that's now composing for my new movie is a, a young woman from, from Iceland that I just heard her music. Uh, our music supervisor gave me a couple of her cues. She did a little TV show in, in Iceland, and, and I was like, let's go for it, let's go for it. So she came in, she's, she's scoring from Iceland, first movie ever. Um, my editor's first time ever, she's from Zurich. Um, I love taking huge shots with distinct voices. So these, these, like in these particular two cases, these two strong women from other countries whose point of view, I find that I see their muscles, I see the way, you know, how they've handled the world as women and as trying to get their voices out there and I relate to it. And I'm like, come help me tell this story, taking these huge shots. So I could get every Oscar winning editor or every Oscar winning composer and come in, but when you see Knock at the Cabin, you are going to feel that, that there are three immigrants, me and these two ladies, there's th that we're marginalized people, we keep fighting, we're, you know, you're gonna feel a different kind of voice and a different kind of strength and, and for me, that's why you're gonna come to the movie theater to, to, to see and hear that, just that slightly different thing. So you guys, you know, honing who you are, don't, I mean, I'm always like, don't, to my daughter, Shivani, who's here somewhere here, uh, who loves Temple, by the way, she's a senior, so hopefully right. she, she might be, she might be with you guys <laughs> next year. Keep her, if she comes here, keep her out of trouble, all right? right. I'm, everyone here. I'll give you all my, my cell phone and you can text me if she's like... She's <laughs> Whatever it takes to yeah. get her yeah, here, yeah. Right? She's hanging with the football team. Get down here. That's right. Um, <laughs> um, you know, the, you guys finding your, your individual voices, the thing that makes you specific to yourself, that doesn't mean rebellion. Rebellion is another version of, you know, either joining the system or you're fighting the system. It's, it's some balance of, of the two. What is it, you know? There's parts of me that are really accessible. I love cheeseburgers. Michael Jordan's my favorite athlete. There's things that are just like, Dad, Seinfeld's my favorite comp. I'm like right down the thing. And there's parts of me that like, I love black and white Japanese movies. There's things that are more like on the edge and it's that combination of those two things that make you guys hear my voice. So I can't pretend one isn't and one is. They're all that, and then being honest about you know whether you're the lawyer or that wherever whatever way you're coming in. My, I'm always like like I've just been. I'm like go find me some young buck lawyers. Go my go find me. I want people that care that are really thinking about it, thinking about stuff. Because in this moment, I, you know, whenever I I'm, my team now is so scared to get on the phone with me. I say, if you're gonna get on the phone with me and spitball ideas about my life and my company off the top of your head, I'm gonna annihilate you. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do that. Don't do that. I'm thinking about this my whole, my whole, all, all day long. So you better be careful when you call me that it's really thought out that there's, I, hey, I think you should do X for X, Y, Z reason. You know, there's this branding opportunity with this company or th this, you know, Marvel came and said this. I think you should say no or yes because of this. And I'm thinking about it, but it's always a, a kind of putting it next to your value systems. And by value systems, I don't mean like, Kumbaya, I mean, hey, this is, this is like for me, process is critical. I won't win unless I, have, unless I have the process to fail, succeed, fail, succeed safely. So that's what I need. So I can only do that if I pay for it and I fail, fail, fail. You know, like for example, I was reminiscing about S Split, <clears throat> my movie Split. So first time we screened it, we screened it here at the Prince for a bunch of people, like 200 people, and it was a disaster. Disaster! I was hiding, I sneak in, and then I came back downstairs, and <laughs> these two ladies are going to the bathroom, and I, this is a, a famous quote in our company now. I heard the two ladies going, I don't know how you fix that. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh. 
I was like against a pillar and I was hiding and I was like, oh, man, I should have been a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and you know, that if, if, this, if there was a company there, right, that would, they would have stepped in and they would have, you know, and I, would have, I was wobbly, you know, I was wobbly. But I was like, hey, how do you do a sequel? I don't, know, I don't want to ruin it for you guys, but how do you do a sequel to a movie without letting them know it's a sequel? And so that was the whole concept. And so just, you know, as always, it, it, it wasn't one thing. It was 100 little things. And just go do the next five things the next morning and the next five things the next morning. And then suddenly it became, hey, this isn't so bad. And then it became, hey, this is pretty good. And then it ended up, we went and screened it, cut to like seven months later. We screened it in Austin at a surprise screening where they didn't know what they were coming to. And we screened it. And it was like they were going to tear the seats out of the theater. They were, they were screaming at the end so loud. And I was like, Phew, you know? And that was a happy ending. But, you know, um, and it, but it may not be a happy ending. You may not figure it out, you know? And so you just have to risk that. It's called, you know, this is a psychology term, negative capability, the ability to keep one foot in the unknown and one foot in security. That's what we all need to develop. Don't try to protect yourself. Keep that, keep that, that, that strength of hold, hold. I'm not sure, but I have knowledge. I'm sure I can figure this out. That's all you need to be confident in. Don't say, I know yet. I'm, I'm going to figure it out. And so build that, building that up in whatever field you have, that's what I look for. And these two women that I mentioned have that. You know, they're scared too. This is their big shot, right? And they don't want to, and, but they, they have just the right foot in knowledge and, and the foot in the unknown, and they're figuring it out. And sometimes they don't get it right, and then they go, I know how to fix it. And they keep going. And all of us being resilient together, uh, Will make us. We may not get there with Knock at the Cabin. It's a super challenging movie, but you know, if you keep doing this, you're going to end up going in the right direction. You know, in aggregate, you're going to go. It might be like this, but it's going in the right direction. So you've talked about your creative potential. You talked about the risk taking, the perseverance. You have ascended now. You're still taking risks, and you have one foot in and one foot out, as you said. You're still taking risks, but you have ascended now to a point where you have a level of success which will allow you to continue to go. You're a leader in the industry. What responsibility do you have and others like you around diversity, around bringing mm. people in, in front of the camera, behind the camera, mm. so that it reflects the machine? reflects the diversity of mm, the audience. Mm, mm. Do you feel like you have that responsibility? Do you feel like you have that power as you are more independent than some? Mm, mm. Or yeah. do you feel like that comes at a, at a different time or through a different channel? No, that's, I mean, look, very complex conversations. You know, I, well, how can I say this? I, uh, I came on the scene before everybody was woke. So it was like, you know, they were like, we hate this dude. I'm like, oh, really? I wonder why. Um, but, you know, but there was no voice, there was no platform, nothing, you know. And, you know, to some extent, I was telling white stories. But I was just using, you know, uh, characters that were white, you know. And so it, it's a very, there's no precedent for this. There was no precedent for this that... As it turned out, one of the most popular storytellers in the world was not white, telling essentially just story. I mean, to me, it wasn't any skin color. It was just stories, you know? And, but the perception was, hey, these are white families, white stars, white everything, and, and he's not white. And, and then I'm driving down the boulevard, and I'm seeing his name, you know, selling. So like, how dare he, you know? It was, oh. it was like, it was, it was a lot of how dare he, you know, about it all. And, you know, for me, I... Again, take it as a as a, a, a opportunity to you know double down and make me, myself my voice strong. If it was easier, maybe I wouldn't be sitting here talking about the projects that I'm talking to you about and being been so fortunate um, that you know you know the obstacle is the way that vibe you know that 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 made me and for ever, for us you know when we talk about like uh, uh, women's voices and immigrant voices it's really important to me you know there was one season i think of servant that i don't think there was only my daughter who uh, shivani's older sister was the only one born in the united states everybody else was from another country um, so the international voices are are critical to me when i i think one of the reasons that i'm um, my international is actually stronger than my domestic box office and i think one of the reasons is they see themselves in, in, in me, and so when I go to Brazil, they see themselves that, oh, you went to U U US and you made it, and I, even Japan or you name it, any country, Spain, you, you're one of us and you, you went there and you made it because we represent the kind of the, the dream, right, to be in America. So that immigrant thing really does 
play with me and stick with me. Um, and, and as I said, just me personally, not an agenda, the, 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 the female perspective on storytelling, I, I relate to it very, I don't, not as an agenda, I just like where their strength comes from. And it, it feels more, more akin to where, where I find my strength. So, so Servant, again, without agenda, was directed by half the, half the episodes are directed by women and half by men, which for a male showrunner, I don't think that's ever happened before. And for me, that's just because I, I love where they're, they're, how, they, how you guys describe you know, pain and struggle. And, and it just felt more connected to these two women who were the leads of the, of the show. So organic, organic admiration and for the, the, these different points of views. And, and I think it's naturally, you know, if you consider my, my little world as a microcosm, our office is diverse just because I, I find it very interesting where, where you came, oh, you came from Mexico, and that's great, tell me more. Oh, you're, you're indigenous, you know, tell me more about that, and I, I, I like that. Yeah, and I think you being willing to model your success, being here today, is evidence of that. Oh, thanks. We've had all week where students have come to me and said, we're so glad that he is coming here this Thursday to speak to us, Temple University, because what he represents, what he's done, who he's hired, is really something that we haven't seen. And we need models like him to be able to give us motivation so that we can continue. Because you're right, it takes a lot of resilience in this industry. You have to be creative, you're gonna be shut down a lot, there's a lot of criticism, there's a lot of barriers, and you have to be able to overcome all of that. And when you're a minority, it's even harder to do that because this is an industry that's unforgiving. So I just want to thank you for oh, thank you. representing that and being here to do things like this today, uh, which, is, which is so oh, helpful. Thank you. I, do, so, I, I have hired a bunch of you guys already, so there's a lot of temple in fact, in some drunken nights, I get to, there's a temple like cheer that you guys do, and I get them to do that. Absolutely. So. <laughs> we'll do that at the end of the interview. How about that? <laughs> so, so you talked about you coming onto the scene before the woke environment. Um, now we're in a cancel culture mm -hmm. environment. So can, have you been canceled, question number one, and how much as a business owner, as a director, how yeah. much do you worry about your stakeholders, your actors, your directors, mm. your partners, doing behavior outside of the creative space, Great getting question. in trouble and messing up your whole success train. Yeah, wow, you, you went right there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's Have real. you been canceled yet? You know, I'm sure. I, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, I, you know and, and this new movie, it's very, you know, all the movies I do, but this one coming up, we'll see. We'll, we'll see, you know, you, you, even when you try to do good, you don't do it the way they want you to, to, want you to say it, and then it'll be, ah! Um, I, there's so many things to what you just asked me. One of the big risks is, I already told you guys, I pay for my movie, so this isn't just about what I could make on a movie, this is the whole, the whole thing could go down, right? If, if there's, so it, it is precarious. We do do like, we do do, you know, we do our checking, to just have you heard anything about this person ever? <laughs> Has anyone ever heard anything <laughs> bad? Any anything? What? And then you triple check it. You know, I, we do we do ask that because yeah. uh, uh, this is a, a, a big topic, a big, a very important, topic, very precarious thing, and we want to make sure that we have the best environment and we're and we're supporting the right people. Um, all you can do, I don't think you can ever, you know, in anything, even when we're just talking about cancel culture essentially is like another a version of fitting in and how do we do it and how do we promote good values and again, how I do it or someone else does it may not be enough or, you know, um, um, you know, for me, like when I see like Jordan, Jordan Peele do his thing and Jordan's been super gracious to me. I mean, just incredibly gracious to me personally and saying how much I meant to him and how much I influenced him and all of that stuff. That makes me feel it's worth whatever fights that, that and whatever hits I get. You know that you know everything we do, we don't realize it, but everything has such impact. Like I was, I, I FaceTime my 
uh, like uh, my aunt's mom, my, who, who married in the family, and she's like 97 years old in India, and she got on a FaceTime, and I just wanted to say, hey, I hadn't talked to you, and how are you? And then she's like, my first name is Manoj, and she's like, Manoj, how are you? I tell everyone it's the greatest pride of my life that uh, I'm related to you. And I'm like, oh my God, everything I do has such impact. Oh. <laughs> uh, and, and, and it's true for all of us. We don't realize that there's this 95-year-old lady in India that's like, so proud of everything that I'm doing. And I'm like, ah, oh, you know, and, and, but it gave me, you know, like, keep checking yourself, keep checking yourself. And I'm, you know, there's no way at this point not to get um, ruffle, ruffle, ruffle somebody. There's just no way around it. But again, if you're coming from the right place, that will, that will come through. I mean, it's swinging, you know, it swings yeah. like this. And I, I, again, I, I keep doubling down on, don't, just like I tell my, my representatives, don't just get on the phone and, and spitball. You guys don't get on, in your life and spitball huge decisions about your life, who your friends are, what your job is, what you're doing, what you're gonna do tonight, you know? You think, oh, I'm gonna do it, but is it, with, is it in alignment with, that, with, the, with the value systems? And, and again, you're, you're, you're gonna make 1,000, 10,000, 100,000 decisions in your life. If you're confident about what your value systems are, it will, it will in aggregate go in the, in the right direction. So, but it is a, a, a big aspect of you know, the public relations aspect of what we do. We're very public, you know? Very, you're very, so talk to us a little bit about the intersection of your professional life and your personal life. So you mm. just talked about how you got to a point in your career yeah. where you had to have a conversation with your wife about we're gonna mortgage the house and put everything yes. on the line yes. and it may not work. Yes. You have to shoot movies, most of which are in the region, but you have to go on set and all over the place, all over the world, attracting talent, you know, doing whatever you do. So you're away from home. Yeah. You have you know, uh, children that you uh, want to be a good father to, right? So how have you been able to, and this is, this is for all the students who are thinking about, can I be M. Night Shyamalan and can my life be balanced? Particularly millennials and yeah. Gen Z, they want to know, am I yeah. going to be able to have the kind of life that allows me to have balance or yeah. am I going to be all in? Our generation tends to be all in. Yes. So is that how you are or have you found ways to be able to live the kind of life they want to live? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I'm definitely all in, you know, in, in, you know, in everything that, that I do. Look, you guys grew up with something we didn't grow up with, that phone and um, uh, the not present device, as I like to call it. Um, it, it it's built to make you unhappy. It is, it, that's it's engineered to keep you not in the present. Being present is what will make you at peace, and it's just built to do that. You guys, it's, it's in every one of your pockets. It's at least three hours of your day. Maybe seven, uh, right? It's it, it, you have. I got a, the right topic for yeah, you. This is no, this is your topic. No, right this here, is <laughs> this is. I mean, it's just. I I'm not sure I could I would have been sitting here if I had had to deal with what you guys have to deal with that pervasive thing of pulling and you know it wants you to feel that dopamine rush of checking 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 and then that that bad feeling that comes from oh hey he's doing better than me or she's doing oh my my ex girlfriend's doing what man and you know, all those things that we feel we we were just sitting and talking and now I saw this text I saw this thing hey and and it, it's it's very very hard I you know. Could the Bronte sisters have written their books today? Is <laughs> they be like, you know? It, 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 and, and it's, it's I, I, it affects me. If I, I mean, our mental health is at an all-time low. I mean, for the people that um, that work for me and all, they are shaky. They are, they are shaky, and um, I don't know how us as as a, as a species as, is dealing with this. How we're going to deal with it? You can see it. In anything you want to look at, that mental health is at its lowest that it's ever been because of this thing. Um, you know, just think about our sports teams. I don't know if you guys watch basketball. I mean, we drafted two number one players, the Sixers, that have issues shooting. That has never that froze. Right? That's not that's not a just a coincidence. That's generational thing that's happening. That we're not present. We're we're seeing it in this huge way. Um, and so I, I I find that very poignant and. You know that we're all those guys that we're, we're freezing as we're as we're looking so very very hard. But I, I would say the thing that counters that is the balance of it. Going, hey, you know, I've never been the person that goes, hey, I'm going to get my job and then I'm going to get married and start a family. I'm going to do like it's always together that they help each other. 
that mm-hmm. they, that it is, and you know, I have cousins that are like, I'm like, when are you gonna ask that girl to marry her? We've been dating her forever. I'm just gonna get, I wanna get secure, and then I'm, and then I'm gonna ask her, and um, I'm not that guy, you know, I'm, I'm all in, you know, right away. Hey, I don't know how I'm gonna make it in the movie industry, you wanna marry me, you know, like, you know, <laughs> uh, you know I'm all in. And, and irony is they've helped each other. They have, they have helped each other, and the things that we call limitations end up become, you know, razor sharp. So, you know, hey, she's starting a PhD program in Bryn Mawr, all right, we're not going to be able to travel much, you know, that kind of thing, turn that into a positive. You know, it, the, the movies and all are set in Philly, that kind of thing. Oh, we're having a baby, okay, I'm gonna have less time. When I work, it's super focused. Oh, hey, they offered me this, uh, this, this book of Stuart Little to write, so I wrote Stuart Little, the movie, and, and so, oh, that's an adopted little mouse. Well, well that's like, all right, you know, baby, you know, and we'll, we'll write, we'll, I'll write one about it. It always kind of, it starts to feed each other in this incredible way, and so, you know, in my particular case, you know, a lot of my movies are about families, and they have these certain, you know, the, 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 my nightmares about what could happen. And so it, in there, and so I, ironically, the thing that you think is getting in the way of your career is the thing that's fueling your career. And then when I go and meet a head of a, you know, a company and they want me to work, I'm like, they can feel there's no amount of money that would ever make me betray those things. And so I'm actually more valuable because, for that, because it's not, uh, you can't buy my value systems away from me. So, uh, you know, I, and I think that's, you know, you, you guys are, you have so much to deal with emotionally. And as I said, I mean, staggering, no, nothing like we had or the generations before us. And the best you can about being present and taking that thing and putting it away and cultivating habits that you, it's a war for your attention. That thing is at war with you. And you guys have to build muscles that we didn't have to. This, this was my, my childhood was, Literally like a Spielberg movie. We used to, I used to ride bikes, come home, go over, ding dong, can, can Joey come out and play? Are you still finishing his homework? All right, I'll sit on the grass. <laughs> <laughs> the bike's laying on the grass, I'm just, you know. Then Joey comes out, all right, let's go, get, let's go get Dave. Then we all ride our bikes to Dave's, ding dong, and we do that. Then we go to the park and then pretend this or whatever, or say, you know, that girl's hot or whatever we were talking about. <laughs> and, then drive home before dinner. I mean, ride home before dinner. Present, not, we didn't know anything except, you know, Joey and Dave. That was it. And, and that's not possible for you guys. That's not, that's not possible. That, that, what I just described is like this fake scene that was every day, you know? The brain develops in a different way. You guys, your brains develop. You know, you guys have actively have to fight this, you know? Um, so that you can have your own voices and your own thing, because as I'm telling you, the reason I hired the, the lady from Iceland is her voice was so distinct that I thought it was more valuable than all those million dollar composers, and so I went for it, you know? So that was BMI, you know, you, you know, understand who you are, don't run from it, and protect yourself as much as you can, actively protect your mental health as you go on. It doesn't get any easier, and it just keeps accreting. Your good habits and your bad habits keep, keep accreting. So I always say to Shivani and, and our girls, every day, by the way, dinner is a TED Talk, so if you ever want to come over to dinner, <laughs> <laughs> whatever you do, you're going to do it 10,000 times. Are you okay with that? So working out, you know, going to bed at 1 o'clock in the morning, you know, whatever it is, looking at your phone for three, you're going to do it 10,000 times. Are you going to like that person, uh, you know, 10 years from now? Is that, are you going to be where you want to be? You know, so it's every decision, uh, it, it crafts who you are, and then you become very valuable to all of us that, that need you to help guide us. So let me ask you one more question, and then we're, uh, I think, about out of time. I want to know how you want to be remembered. Uh, one of the things I'm most impressed about, all the work that you do, so you work with Bruce Willis, and you've got these addictive shows, and you, know, you are the man in Hollywood. But you've also started the foundation, and you create leaders out of entrepreneurs who are underserved, who otherwise wouldn't have the opportunity. Can you tell us a little bit about that foundation, maybe through a profile, um, and if that's not integrated with how you want to be remembered, how you want to be remembered? You know, I think the, 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 the thesis that runs through the foundation, um, that runs through my personal life, the things I've talked to you about, and, and the movies, the, the storylines in the movies, is, a, is a, a reactivation of our agencies, so that we've been talked out of it. Um, it. All of us get talked out of it at every moment. And, how to reignite everyone's agency, whether it's the book you know, that I, was write, I wrote about that was about closing the achievement gap, which is essentially about a, you know, the, the, the inner city, low-income communities. Those children have been talked out of their agency. 
and how do you give, remind them that, they're, they're, that, that they have agency again, and that essentially is what the achievement gap is. Um, and whereas other people believe, oh, they can't learn, but that's not at all what it is. You know, we get talked out of it, and if you change the gender, the, 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 the races of it, the exact same thing would happen again. Um, and so with, in the foundation work, we look for leaders in the world that have, against all odds, turned this around in their communities. And we go, we go vet them, we go um, all around the world and say, hey, wait a minute, how did you do this? and check if it's real, see what they're gonna do, and then we prescribe nothing and we say, what do you want? And they say, we want X amount of money to do this, and we say, it's yours. And what you find is these individuals, these angels in these communities that have figured out a way to reignite agency in all of the people around them, whether it's in a war-torn area or impoverished areas, and they're doing the impossible, and the people here in Philly that are doing the impossible, um, and if you guys look at our website, these things that they're doing, it, it just doesn't seem mathematically possible that you could do it. It, it, it reminds you how resilient we all are. Uh, it, it's amazing. I love to be around them. So there is a sense of agency that runs through it all. For me, legacy-wise, I mean, you know, uh, as you can tell, it's like, you know, when, um, whether meeting someone in a criminal justice situation or meeting you guys or, or talking to an actor or an artist, I'm trying to remind them of, how, how, how much they are connected to the universe and how limitless you guys are in, in, in each and every moment. And I forget it, I'm, you know, I'm tired, you know, and I, I know how easy it is to lose it, you know, and I can, you know, I'm just as lost as the most lost person and I need to, to, to find it again and go, no, no, um, what, 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 that thing that makes me weird that, that I'm blind about is part of the beauty of the vision. I'm blind, don't concentrate on the fact that I didn't see that. You know, what, why, why is this so beautiful to me? And kind of talk, you, talk to you about, and don't, don't shy away from the sides that are not so great about, about yourself. So I'm, I, I, hope, I hope at the end of the day, you know, that you guys, you know, just see one person who, you know, kept trying, you know, just, it just kept trying, you know. And, and, and I've been so lucky, I've been so grateful. So, I mean, um, you know, th thank you guys for letting me talk to you guys and all. It's another wonderful opportunity for me. And I can't wait to see all your great work. Thank you, sir. Look at this. <laughs> So I'd just like to say in closing, M. Night Shyamalan, we are supporters of you here in this region, around the country, around the world. We are so thankful that you do good, high quality, creative work. You've obviously been financially successful, but you've taken some risks, you've taken some chances. You have modeled for us how you make sure to put your creative best foot forward. You have modeled for us how to make sure that we are including diversity into the machine. You have modeled for us how we can be excited about the future of work, the future of entertainment, the new technologies that are on the horizon, but not let go of the old standards that have allowed us to do the work in the way that we are doing it. So I hope that you all have seen and been able to see what I've seen. My new friend here has so much to offer our society, so much to offer the industry, so much to offer education. We look forward to you coming back to another edition of Talks at Temple. Thank you again for sharing your insights. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
uh, how the Performing Arts Center can take a stage in five minutes and transform it from one set to another. We're going to put some music on. Please enjoy yourselves, and we'll be back with you in a few moments. We encourage you to think about what you've just heard about and share your uh, experiences with the folks around you, and we will have our second discussion coming up in five minutes. Thank you. <laughs> 